Hello and welcome to Helena Estates. I'm Paul Trudell. And I'm Kara Domerto. And you're listening to episode number 567. Really getting up there with our numbers. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we thought we'd spend a little time today talking about a recent decision out of the Saskatchewan Court of Queen's Bench. It's a decision of Justice McMurtry, who is uh, <laughs> related to our chief here. Um, it's an excellent decision. It's the decision of Cot and Cot. And you have a fun fact about the uh, name of the case? Yes, cot means cat in Russian. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the cot and cot decision, and it talks um, a bit about the evidence that's required in order to commence a will challenge and what hurdles you have to get over before you're allowed by the court to proceed with a will challenge. There are some unusual circumstances in this case that illustrate uh, the type of evidence that you need to put before the court and what may happen if you take your time or delay in doing that. So maybe we can talk a bit about the, the, the facts of this decision. Right, so um, the deceased in this case, um, his name was Sheridan Cott. Uh, he died on September 15th, 2015. He was survived by his wife, Rhonda, and his two brothers, Robin and Claire. So the three of them, um, Robin, Claire, and Rhonda, were the estate trustees of the deceased estate, and they administered the estate for nearly three years until Rhonda brought this application, and the two issues that had to be determined by the court was one, whether the will should be revoked because uh, the deceased uh, committed an act of intentional destruction or declaration that the will is invalid. Um, and if the will is not revoked for that reason, that there are suspicious circumstances and you know she made allegations of undue influence um, from the brothers in this right. case. So the deceased in this case yeah. made a will. It was uh, pretty much a handwritten will that he mm -hmm. prepared himself. It was this, it was signed about 13 months before he passed away. Yeah. Um, the will was actually probated by the spouse and the two brothers. So probate was granted and there was an affidavit sworn saying that that was his last will. Yeah. Um, subsequently, the wife, Rhonda, determined that she didn't like the way things were working out under the will and brought this application to have it set aside on the basis of uh, revocation and undue influence. Um, on the issue of uh, revocation, the evidence there from Rhonda was that the deceased made the will, he had the original in his possession, she swapped the original with a copy. So she had the original, the deceased only had a copy, and her evidence was that the deceased tore up the copy of the will. Yeah. And that's how they were able to get probate with the original. The yeah. copy, what he tore up was the uh, was a copy. Um, she brought this application to say that um, he thought he had the original and he tore it up and therefore revoked it. Yep. Um, the court uh, dismissed that uh, application with respect to the revocation. She, the court felt that uh, her evidence on that point was weak. Uh, there was also some evidence that she said that she told the estate solicitor yeah. about the revocation of the will and the tearing up of the will and the estate solicitor told her you know what you're better off to have a will than no will at all so you should probate yeah. and Rhonda said that she wasn't told that if the will was in fact torn up she would get the entire estate yeah. Um, the will that was tore up, uh, or that was torn up, that w or that was prepared, provided for certain bequests to uh, the, the, the deceased brothers. Um, so there was also evidence uh, that was admitted from the state solicitor to the effect that that discussion never yeah. happened, and to, he was never told that the will was revoked uh, prior to uh, uh, prior to the deceased's death. So that ground didn't succeed. Yeah. With respect to undue influence, the court felt that there was just a, a, a lack of evidence with respect to any undue influence by the brothers, um, and the court made a, a good observation that um, Rhonda's position was that the uh, deceased was sound enough and fit enough to tear up his will and revoke it. If he was that fit and sound and strong-willed, he couldn't be unduly influenced or was yeah. less likely to be undue in, unduly influenced. Yeah, the, the court definitely felt that there was an inconsistency in the evidence uh, that she put forth. Also, with respect to the undue influence bit, um, one of the brothers got uh, a right of first refusal over the farm, and I believe that that was the biggest issue. The brother who was present when the will was signed and who was a witness was um, Claire, who actually farmed his own farm, and so that didn't really sort of mesh with her idea that there was undue influence there. He was influencing, he just didn't benefit. <coughs> yeah. 
An another neat twist on this case is the passage of time. We, we said that the, uh, the deceased died, the will was probated, they proceeded to administer the estate in accordance with the, uh, the probated yeah. will for a, a number of years. And this application wasn't brought until about three and a half years later. The court didn't find that that delay it's in, it's in itself was <laughs> fatal. Um, the court did say, however, that the fact of the delay uh, impacted on uh, the credibility of Rhonda with respect to her position that the will was revoked. So um, there was a discussion of the um, uh, Newberger decision, which dealt with the issue of delay. Um, yeah. And they applied that <coughs> case to say that um, the will challenge could proceed notwithstanding the delay. However, it did impact on the evidence. There's no discussion in this case about any limitation period, though. And yeah. uh, in Newberger, the will challenge was brought within the limitation period. Yeah. Um, they don't refer to any limitation periods in this proceeding, and the court didn't feel it needed to rely on that in order to stop this from going. There simply just wasn't enough evidence yeah. to get over the, the initial hurdle of putting out a, a strong prima facie case of uh, revocation or undue influence. Yeah. Even though realistically it had been well, uh, well above the two-year time period from date of death, so that could have been a very easy argument to make too because right. as a co-estate trustee she was administering the estate in accordance with this will. She had all this evidence before her and she really did not provide any additional evidence as Justice McMurtry noted right. that would allow her to proceed with this. Right. And it sort of reminds me of the libel decision where one of the beneficiaries actually received benefit under the will yeah. and only later decided to challenge the will. And in this case, it appears that uh, Rhonda did receive benefit and acted as if the will was valid for a number of years and swore an affidavit when the application for probate yeah. was filed to say that the will was uh, valid and the last will. Yeah. So it's a, it's a helpful decision on those points and uh, in uh, illustrating the type of evidence that you need to put forward. Um, you need to have a, a pretty strong case, particularly where uh, probate has already been granted in order to get the, uh, uh, the probate revoked and allow you to continue with the, uh, with the will challenge. Yeah, and I think that it's a helpful um, point to maybe make here uh, from the drafting solicitor because you know Rhonda said that the drafting solicitor made these comments to her and you know the drafting solicitor didn't tell her what would happen if the estate was administered and test to see aka she would get it all um, this is a, a sort of important um, thing to think about um, you know uh, reporting to the client right. so it makes me wonder I wonder what you know what this particular lawyer uh, reported to these clients and whether you know this was covered in his reports um, so it's always important to remember to sort of do all of that especially in situations like these where you know they're telling you that the original is there but perhaps she said that right, you know a right. copy was torn up although I'm not even sure she would have brought it up at that time right but, but if it was brought up I think it illustrates mm -hmm. the necessity yeah. of keeping good notes if you are a solicitor if your clients are telling you certain things make sure you make a note of those because sure. it may become relevant down the road okay. Um, one other just little tidbit from this decision that I thought was interesting is that the court talks about um, what would happen if the will challenge was allowed to proceed even though probate had been granted and the court said there was two options that the court has. One is to uh, revoke the uh, certificate of appointment or probate and allow the will to proceed or it, allow it the certificate to stand and just put a stay on the distribution of the estate right. until the uh, will challenge is dealt with. So um, we'll put a link to this decision on our um, pod, uh, on our website. Um, until then, thank you for listening. And if you have any comments, please email us at webmaster at or leave us a comment on our blog. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.